our Father in heaven, you are the great physician. Father, we invite you into this meeting. We invite you into this recording. Uh, I invite you, Lord, into the sitting room of each of uh, the viewers and those who will view this recording even subsequently, that, Lord, you will go before us, that your message will proceed from my mouth and that all shall learn from you. It's my prayer that your holy angels will excel in power, that your Holy Spirit shall be with us. I pray this believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the spirit of prophecy tells us that we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. This is taken from a book, Live Sketches, of Ellen White, page 196. Um, it's not just the spirit of prophecy which recognizes the role of history. Uh, one, of the hist one of the individuals called George Santayana states that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Uh, in all our lives, we've experienced, an, we've experienced something from which we've learned from. A small child knows what fire feels like only after he has experienced it. Uh, I have small children, and they know that a knife is sharp because they've tried to touch it and it has pricked them. So with us, and so with us as human beings. In the year 1918, there was a disease which arose similar to what we are going through, and it was called the Spanish flu. Uh, now, before we talk about the Spanish flu, it's important for us to recognize that uh, the, the message the health message which we carry as Adventists is actually the right hand of the gospel message which we need to take to the world. The book Medical Ministry, page 259, says that it's the Lord's design that restoring the influence of health reform shall be part of the last great effort to proclaim the gospel message. And we know that our gospel message uh, is that we need to be physically fit, mentally sound, emotional, emotionally healthy, and spiritually healthy as well. Uh, and the, message, the health message at the right hand of the gospel is carried in the book Review and Herald, June 20th, uh, 1899. Now, uh, historically, as I stated, uh, there was a flu similar to the COVID-19 which I'm experiencing now and it's the Spanish flu of 1918. I'm sure you might have read about it, but I'll quickly give you a snapshot of what happened and what lessons we can learn from it. It started with soldiers and sailors and their friends, you know, and uh, the victims at that time were young and healthy, and uh, there was a very high death rate. This is because at that time, there was no penicillin, there were no antibiotics. You know, the soldiers traveled to different parts of the world after having been together uh, in World War I. And uh, the main cause of, the, uh, of death at that time was pneumonia. And uh, 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 COVID-19, which is a current pandemic, has actually a much, much lower um, mortality rate than did the Spanish flu. Because out of the, 18, 19, out of the 1918 flu, as a world, we learned a lot about sanitation measures. Now, what kind of virus was it? It was uh, similar to the current coronavirus. It was what we call medically the A stroke H1N1. And uh, there were at least half a billion people infected and uh, at least 50 million passed away. The disease was said to be zoonotic. What does zoonotic mean? Zoonotic actually stands for those diseases which jump from animals to human beings. Uh, in this case, it was from birds, and um, uh, CDC states that uh, in US alone, there were at least 675,000 deaths. And the age groups were 
the children younger than five years, those who are deemed healthy, you know, 20 to 40 years, and then over the 60, over 65 year olds. And um, we are told that uh, at least 40 percent of the army personnel developed symptoms of this pneumonia. Now, the armies were known to provide the best care, but how did they compare with the Adventist message? And I think these are the lessons which I would like us to carry home today. We know that uh, by that time, Ellen White had already lived and died, and the, what we call the health message today, the book Ministry of Healing, Councils on Diet, and the like were already in existence. And there are several sanitariums which had been established, and health message was strong within the Adventist uh, world. We know that the sanitariums treated at least 1,223 patients. And uh, uh, around 400 were within restrictions of the sanitarium, and 677 were in the various homes, as in they were not supervised. And uh, I like to mention that only 2.4% got pneumonia, and out of those who got pneumonia, uh, six passed away, as in 11 got pneumonia, six passed away, 2.4, again representative of the big number, and out of those who got pneumonia, 54% uh, uh, died. Now, um, 1.3 of the total influenza patients died who had received hydrotherapy in their various places. This is in comparison with at least 3.8 who died while undergoing the best treatment in the best centers at that time. The point which my viewer, you might have got is that uh, the sanitarium treatment was actually much more superior, even in homes, as opposed to the best centers which existed at that time. Now, again, these statistics are very clear. 16.7% pneumonia with the best medical care vis-a-vis 2.4% with the best sanitarium care. Death rate of 6.7 in the best medical care vis-a-vis 1.3% in the best sanitarium care with hydrotherapy and other Adventist modalities, which we're going to consider this evening. Now, um, an individual called, uh, 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 no, a center called Hutchison City uh, Health Officer Report indicates that uh, there was actually um, a concentrated infection in an institution where 90 of the 120 students living in a dormitory got the infection. And what treatment was offered to them? It was just simple good nursing care, regulated health, rest, no drugs, and hydrotherapy. I like to report that in this specific situation, there were zero cases of pneumonia, despite 90 out of 120 students uh, contracting the, the Spanish flu. No deaths, and it was a remarkable record which has gone into very many journals, and there are several studies that have been done uh, trying to determine what happened so that there was no cytokine storm, as you may be hearing in the news, that that's what happens when someone gets the COVID-19 disease as well. Now, the H1, N1 pandemic, of course there are several things which we can learn from it. It's not, that, it's not the same virus, right? Um, but then we know that the, the heat-specific proteins which are released when someone has COVID-19 were also similarly released in the H1N1 infection of the 1918 epidemic. Now let us go to the current uh, epidemic which we have in the world, the COVID-19 disease. We know from science that the disease takes a specific course. There's a phase one, which is infection, a phase two, which is uh, the symptoms start showing, and then phase three, for those who move from phase two, where there's hospitalization in on ICU and ventilators. Now, I pray that we all, even if we get the infection, it ends in phase two and not phase three. 
This is because we need to boost our immune systems. We have the health message which, which is supposed to help us do that so that we boost our numbers from the 80% to even higher because only 20% actually proceed from phase two to phase three uh, where there's hospitalization and on ICU and ventilator, ventilatory support. Uh, these are the statistics when I did this first presentation on uh, May 30th of this year in this church. We only had 5.9 people infected. Today, as at 9.30 in the morning, uh, 9.27 to be specific, there are 22,000. That tells you there's a fourfold increase in the numbers of the people with COVID-19 disease. I'll not uh, burden you with medical jargon in terms of how the infection happens, but I'd like to state that the virus is a, is a positive RNA virus, which basically uses the body's natural biological mechanisms to infect our diseases through what we call the SE receptors. And then when it gets into our system, it multiplies itself, what we call replication, uh, and thereby releasing uh, itself to affect other cells. In the process, the virus uh, actually multiplies and creates other several proteins which, call what, which, which uh, cause what we call the cytokine storm. Now, this is um, for a medical uh, student or med medical person, they would quickly correlate to what I've uh, sketched on that slide, that the virus gets in, its capsule uh, connects with our cellular membranes, and you can see it replicating uh, from the three end to the five end and back. But also we know that it, sometimes it does the smaller proteins, which now cause what we call the cytokine storm, which presents the symptoms which uh, we all know. Now, the main symptoms which complicate in most patients is uh, what we call the pulmonary edema because of the influx of the uh, products of the virus. And we get that uh, it also affects the blood vessels um, in what uh, is called microthrombi formation in the various vessels. And the clinical presentation or the symptoms which we have are as a result of these effects. I'd like to also bring to your attention that as per the CDC studies, uh, no, as by the Journal of uh, America Association uh, article, which was released in April, we realized that uh, on, the, on those below age 18, there are very few deaths. It's only 50 out of 116 uh, patients, uh, 116,000 patients affected. Uh, and these statistics keep rising. And we realize that those above age 85, the mortality is very high. Uh, so it is a totally different virus from the, from the Spanish flu virus. But I'd like to uh, let you know that the strategies which were used in the, 18, in the 1918 uh, Spanish flu pandemic are actually very effective for the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus as well. Um, what are some of the silent details which have to do with COVID-19. This is a very crowded slide, so I'll just summarize it so that my viewer is not bogged down with the details. But I'd like to let you know that those people with hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, chronic pulmonary disease, chronic kidney disease, and malignancies and liver disease are prone, actually up to 25% of them, if they get COVID-19, they are likely to develop the, the full-blown disease. 25% of them, one in four. But the rest of us, the chances are much, much lower. What are the most common symptoms? It's fever, all right, 90%. Dry cough, 60%. Shortness of breath, again, around between, between 53 and 80%. Fatigue, general tiredness, 38%. Nausea and vomiting or diarrhea, 15 to 39%, and myalgia, that is 15 to 44%.
Now, there is also that talk of losing taste and losing sense of smell, but that is only in, uh, actually it's in a, a significant number, 64 to 80% of patients develop this. This is what we call anosmia medically or ageusia. Uh, anosmia, loss of sense of smell, ageusia, loss of sense of taste. The complications of COVID-19, just so that we are together, um, uh, include impaired function of the heart, brain, lung, liver, kidney, and coagulation system. Again, these, these are not seen all the time, but you could have that presenting. Now, for the heart, myocarditis or cardiomyopathy or ventricular arrhythmias and the hemodynamic instability. And uh, for the brain, you could even actually have a, an acute cerebrovascular disease or encephalitis. And again, it's observed in a significant 8% of the patients, which is almost one in 10 which is a significant uh, number. And in those admitted in ICU, we realize that they get strokes, what in medically we call thromboembolic events. Now, uh, additionally, um, out of those hospitalized, we realize that between 17 and 35% of them actually develop what we call hypoxemic respiratory failure, as in they have shortness of breath. Uh, in the medical world, we are accused of using big terms, and I'm sorry uh, today I'm uh, using them, but just to let you know that that stands for uh, challenges with breathing, as in the oxygen concentration level in our blood is below what is expected. And these, a good number of them, 29 to 91% would require uh, support through uh, uh, invasive uh, means. 9% will develop liver dysfunction of some kind, and uh, um, 10 to 25 percent coagulation disorders, and 6 percent what we call septic shock. Now, uh, again, let me jump from that so that we can go to what is uh, critical for us today. Uh, what is the general cause of the disease? Again, phase one, phase two, phase three. I talked about this earlier. Infection, five days, symptoms, seven days, you either recover completely or you become worse, as in worse, shortness of breath or acute respiratory disease syndrome, which we are calling ARDS, and this would require ICU admission. Now, uh, how does this, how does COVID-19 affect our immunity or how does our body try to deal with COVID-19? We have two uh, generally agreed mechanisms of our immunity, and that is the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system uh, is uh, uh, the one which goes through antibodies. I'm sure you've heard of antibodies. And the adaptive immune system goes through what we call the T cells. Now, in COVID-19, just like in HIV, actually that's the only other virus which we've, uh, in the medical world, we've seen having a similar behavior. COVID-19 also does affect our T cells. Uh, I'm, hard, I'm sure you've heard of CD4 counts, you know, uh, uh, CD8 counts for the HIV patients. So COVID-19 actually does also kill our T lymphocytes, just like the HIV um, virus does. And that is what we call the adaptive immune system, using the T cell mediated immune system as opposed to the uh, antibody or the innate immune system. Now, uh, I think we've already talked about this, so I'll jump to the next slide. Just to let you know that uh, uh, this virus, when it affects our bodies, it creates what we call, it, goes, it creates what we call the heat shock proteins, which basically uh, are released from our cells, from the damaged cells, and these cause what we call the cytokine storm. So without really taking you so much deep into the science, I'd like to let you know that um, uh, there are ways in which we can prevent the effects of this um, COVID-19 in our lives. One of them, again, just to uh, uh, take a step back, 
those people that have been immunized for um, a TB through the BCG vaccination, we've noted in the medical world that there's actually a tenfold reduction in terms of the COVID-19 incidences and also mortality, all right? So lower incidences, but also lower mortality. When I talk about mortality is as in the effect of the disease uh, on their bodies, right? It's, it's much lower in those with BCG vaccination, meaning that most probably BCG vaccination has some positive effect on the outcome of COVID-19. But then this is still preliminary. And as you know, with COVID-19, there are so much information is changing so fast that uh, tomorrow it might be a different story. But for today, we've noted that at least epidemiologically that there's a reduced incidence of covid in where in the places where in the countries where BCG vaccination is mandatory, like like Kenya, for instance. Um, as of today, this morning, before I came for this presentation, these are the number of vaccines being developed: 22,103 2, currently. So you might hear of a vaccine, but I like to let you know that at least there's 2,103 trials going on in different parts of the world. This is now the conventional medicine, uh, the medical world, and what they're trying to do in terms of addressing COVID-19. So let's look at a few hypotheses which we are dealing with. It's an infection which downregulates our immunity, our innate immunity, our innate immunity. It's, uh, if it's allowed to progress, uh, if our immunity is low, the infection will progress. And the prognosis is poor uh, for patients who are severely affected. So strengthening our innate immunity will definitely improve or prevent the actual disease from, from, from propagating. And um, uh, there are many leads that are being followed in terms of preventing this disease, including uh, medical therapy from the medical world, but also other strategies to reduce the infection from affecting us. Um, what worked in 1918? You know, they didn't have all this science, but something worked. And what can we learn from them? That is really the ethos of my message this evening. Uh, again, the, the strategies I'm going to propose are not excluding the medical treatment. They are complementary. So please don't get me wrong. Um, if you get COVID, make sure you, you seek medical treatment. But then these strategies can help as well to reduce the symptomatology of the disease. And the goodness with these strategies is that they can be scaled, they can be done at home, they are simple, they are straightforward, and they can help, all right? We know that sleep improves our immunity, at least seven hours of sleep, good nutrition, water, and I'll talk about a strategy called hydrotherapy uh, as part of my presentation as well. Now, nutrition. The more obese you are, the more you're likely to be affected. So let us ensure that nutritionally we don't take uh, things that are going to make us obese. Let's not our, let not our diet be composed of high carbohydrate, glucose, fructose, but let's rather lean more on the healthy side. Rest. Uh, William Shakespeare said that all oh sleep, all oh gentle sleep, nature's soft nurse, how have I frightened thee, that thou no more wilt weigh mine eyelids down and sleep my senses in forgetfulness? This is William Shakespeare. Uh, we know that we need at least seven hours of sleep, whatever age, but these are specific recommendations for your various ages. If you're between 14 and 17, eight to 10 hours, 18 to 25, seven to nine hours, 26 to 64, seven to nine hours. Of course, there are those who sleep longer than it's recommended. So don't ah uh, on that side as well. It's not good for you as well. Uh, Ellen White also um, tells us in several um, spiritual prophecy uh, writings that we need to maintain good sleep. What is good sleep hygiene? All right? Maintain a, sleep, a regular sleep routine. Avoid naps if possible. Don't stay in bed awake for more than five to, to ten minutes. Don't watch TV or read in bed. 
don't drink caffeinated drinks uh, before going to sleep. Avoid inappropriate substances that interfere with sleep. Exercise regularly. I do this regularly, and that's how I get my sleep. Have a quiet, comfortable bedroom. Don't have a radio in your bedroom <laughs> or any form of entertainment. Your bedroom is for sleep, right? If you, are, if you are a clock watch at night, hide the clock. Don't be looking at the clock. Has it reached 10 p.m.? Is it now 11 p.m.? No. Kick out that watch from your bedroom and have a comfortable brief bedtime routine, right? And have a light meal as well. Don't do a heavy meal before sleep. Time is not on my side, so I'll try to hurry up on the next few slides. Um, we have, of course, Ellen White's uh, commentary that we should sleep before 9 p.m., all right? We should wake up early so that we can do a lot of, um, you know, good things to the society. Uh, and I'd like to read this one um, from Manuscript Releases, Volume 7, page 224. I know from the testimonies given me from time to time for brain workers, as in those of us whose professions require a lot of brain power, that sleep is worth far more before than after midnight. So do your sleep before midnight than after midnight. Two hours of good sleep before 12 o'clock are worth more than four hours of sleep after 12 o'clock. That is after midnight. So two hours before, uh, an hour before midnight is actually worth double hours after midnight, if I would put it more plainly. Um, so role of hydrothermal therapy, uh, the hot cold treatment, five minutes of hot, one min uh, half a minute of cold. Even, even if you don't have COVID, you can do it, all right? Uh, contrast showers. If you have the infection, again, be more intensive. It will help, I can assure you. The, actually, a one hour of hot cold treatment boosts your white blood cells a hundredfold. So it's very, very critical. And it has been tried even currently with, uh, in some centers for COVID treatment, and it has been proved to work. I only have three more minutes, so let me just go quickly to the... Uh, so these are studies uh, which confirm this. So I'd like to go to the next strategy, which would be uh, that even as we talk about the strategies, let's not forget the basics, all right? Social distancing, avoiding crowds, practicing standard precautions, avoiding overexposure to the sun. I know right now we've been talking about sunshine, that you need your vitamin D, all right? And as a black person, those of us of black complexion, remember you need at least an hour per day, all right? Don't do it at lunchtime when it's very hot. Do it early in the morning or late in the evening, but make sure you get your one hour of sunshine. Uh, so don't make assumptions. Um, so if, when if you have all your good habits, it's, you only need one wrong habit to get COVID-19. You don't want to know whether you are going to be among the 30 who will be affected or the 3% who are going to require ICU admission. Avoid it at all costs, all right? Now, we know that most of you live in the cities, but try to bring the, outside, uh, the outdoors inside, all right? Open your windows, ribs, balconies, go to the rooftops, enjoy the outdoors, all right? Open spaces, get your fresh air, plants or natural material, avoid pollution. It has been proved scientifically that where pollution is increased, that is above one microgram per meter squared, that there's a 15% increase in you getting, uh, in, you, in you dying from COVID-19 infection. I only have a minute to go. So I'd like to just touch on a few conclusions. That innate immunity, our innate immunity, can be strengthened by manipulating external heat or cold applied to our bodies. Five minutes hot, one minute cold. Don't forget that. Heating and cooling improves our white blood cells. I mentioned that already. And uh, these, these interventions, as much as you might have a fever, they will not... Uh, uh, increase what we call the cytokine storm, which again brings the acute respiratory distress syndrome or pneumonia. And then a simple cold shower, if you're not able to get the heat cold treatment, actually in reduces your risk of even a simple common cold by 29%. 
Um, thank you very much, and may God bless you. Let's pray as we close. Our Father in heaven, your message has gone forth. I've tried my level best to pass the message to my viewer. And Father, I pray that you will expand this knowledge, that they will be enriched, that Father, we shall escape, as you've stated in the book of Psalms 91, that even if a pestilence comes, we shall hide under your shadow. Let us hide under this information you've given us, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.